the overwhelming majority of you have never heard of me, and suddenly I forget who I am. I've never confronted an audience like this in my life, and I can only think of one thing to say. I surrender. <laughs> I usually just wander on to a lecture, up to a lectern and ad lib, but I was so awed by the invitation that I actually wrote something out. But I shall follow the advice of one of my heroes, a fellow called Gore Vidal, and I shall look up from time to time to create the illusion of spontaneity. I, um, this, is, this is a grizzle. It's not an oration, it's not a lecture. It's a grizzle, the sort of thing you get from old blokes once the romantic is replaced by the rheumatic, once the, uh, the pirouette yields to the shuffle. The odds against you being here, of me being here, are beyond calculation. This is not simply a reference to my astonishment at receiving the invitation. It's a rather deeper point. That's because the odds against your existence, my existence, our existence, is vanishingly remote. Improbability does not begin to describe it. Miraculous underestimates our likelihood by so many orders of magnitude. Leaving aside the mysteries of what we used to call the creation, or the Big Bang more recently, we live on a rare jewel of a planet. To be so congenial, so livable, requires that it exists at just the right distance from an appropriate sun. Any further, it freezes. Any closer, it burns. Some cosmological philosophers uh, regard our planet's position in the universe is so rare to make it possible, even probable, that it's unique, that we may well be alone. Others, perhaps the majority, postulate that because of the vastness of the cosmos with its billions upon billions of suns, and there are more suns up there than there are grains of sand on Earth, that there will be so many planets congenial to life and therefore we are not alone, just one of the crowds beyond the clouds who crowd the cosmos. Well, let's put those arguments aside and just look at us, at our species. Our moment of opportunity came when the Earth was clobbered by an asteroid. It wiped out the dominant dinosaurs and gave us this window of opportunity. Even then, our ascendancy was by no means assured or guaranteed or inevitable. Some other life form might have jumped the queue. But after billions of years of foreplay, we were conceived and we were born. Even then our survival, let alone our billions, uh, wasn't axiomatic. Uh, so far, and thus far, no asteroidal uh, collision has knocked us off our perch, but it's certainly in the offing. And a study of DNA suggested that at one time the human population was reduced to a couple of thousand, right to the edge of extinction. Nonetheless, we have thus far survived and thrived, and where the fossil record tells us that millions of species, absolutely millions of species, passed out, and I've got my pages in the wrong order. You see, I lack, I lack military precision. I, um, because we are, because our life is so extraordinary, we should uh, wonder at it, we should marvel at it, and we should be profoundly affected by it. Let's get down, let's get down and dirty. Each of us required a specific sperm, if you'll forgive the expression, to meet with a specific egg, and the mathematical odds of that happening are once again almost beyond calculation. Seeds spilt upon the ground, uh, blocked by contraception, uh, means that every one of us is very lucky to be here. Our lives could have been prevented by parental celibacy or impotence or contraception or abortion. You get the line of argument. Your existence, my existence, our existence is so unlikely that we should be very pleased that we made it, at least thus far. Grateful that we exist. 
One of my favorite words, I'm a, a quite notorious atheist in this country, but I often borrow words from theology. And one of my favorite words is numinous. The numinous is the sense you should get when you walk out on a dark night and look up at the stars and you feel that overwhelming sense of awe and wonderment and even dread that should follow from that apprehension. But uh, many of us don't do that. Many of our human beings have no sense of the numinous. They don't go out and look at the stars because they're too busy looking at telly or squinting at a computer screen. And you observe the same phenomenon when flying around the world. People are in, have a moment to experience something that has never been experienced in human history. Something that a Shakespeare or a Michelangelo would have died to see, the view at an aeroplane window. But instead of looking out the windows at the wonders of the world, people close them. And they look at movies. And if we don't close them, other passengers complain. Thus, we take our lives for granted and we have the audacity to be very easily bored. Now, clearly, I exempt all of you here tonight, both there and up here, from the criticisms that follow. I'm talking about the rest of the population, <laughs> not us. I regard people who are bored as boring and as boorish. To me, an atheist, Boredom is a blasphemy. I think it's um, absolutely appalling that anyone can ever have a moment of boredom in this extraordinary, brief enjoyment of life. Now, decades ago, I calculated the average lifespan of an Australian bloke was around 600,000 hours. I remember pointing this out to my next door neighbour. I live on a farm in the middle of New South Wales, Kerry Packer, that whilst he might have been a billionaire, he wasn't even a millionaire when it came to time. And shortly after I made this observation to Australia's richest man, he was bankrupted by death. And most, the most precious thing he'd had, not money, but time, he'd squandered. And we all squandered, even the busiest and the brightest and the most intellectually curious of us. We coast, we drift, and we seek distraction in the most banal and mediocre of pursuits. Now, theoretically, recent times have been the best of times for us, at Australia the best place to be alive. The majority of human beings who live before us, the majority who live on this planet now, won't make 600,000 hours. They fall far, far short of that biblical allotment. And in any case, it's a gross figure. I used to argue that you could take 50 or 60,000 off the not very grand total because you're too young to know what's going on. And towards the end of life, from now on for me, you can reduce the figure by at least that amount as you fade out in the fog of dementia. Some hundreds of thousands of the 600,000 are spent asleep. Think of all the time you spend sitting on the loo or taking the dustbins to the front gate. Well, you don't do that, but the rest of us are forced to do it at least twice a week. Or perhaps you have to do this enduring very boring meetings or boring lectures. Subtract such low quality time and you're left with only a few hours of time for passionate involvement or intellectual vivacity. Life is short, yet the way we live it makes it even shorter, except in so far as we stretch time by being bored. Now, of course, when you're bored, time passes very, very, very slowly. The majority of our fellow citizens across this wide brown land take their life for granted. Each day is delivered in much the same way that milk used to be delivered or the, the morning paper. I, uh, on the 50th anniversary of television, I remember writing that we hadn't had 50 years of television, but one year of television 50 times. And that's the way most people live their lives, in endless repetition, complaining about being bored, when they do so very little to avert boredom by acting and by thinking. They watch professionals toss balls around instead of tossing them themselves instead of tossing ideas around. 
They seek ways of dulling what they perceive to be the pains of life by being passive spectators to the more energetic and talented, leaping about in this or that sport, or they dull their sensibilities with drugs or dogma or with shopping. I've just come back from China and I went to Tiananmen Square on the day, the anniversary of, those, of that terrible event. The place was almost deserted, not because people were being turned away, but because China had moved on. And if you wanted to see a crowd, you went three blocks down to a shopping mall. That's where the Chinese were on the day of the Tiananmen anniversary. It said that, uh, well, Marx said that uh, religion is the opiate of the people. In China, opium used to be the opiate of the people. Now it's shopping. But shopping is the global opiate, provided you've got enough money to go shopping. Show me some, something mindless, something undemanding, something pointless and silly, and you can back it in that a vast number of human beings will be doing it, not just a little, but a lot. Now, I'm surrounded by people who are pleasant, amiable, decent, but his involvement with issues, with ideas, with anything much beyond family or football, is decidedly limited, unastonished by their own existence, unappreciative of its opportunities. They choose banality, repetition, ordinariness. Their lives are lived, to borrow from the great poet T.S. Eliot, with a whimper rather than a bang, and they whinge about being bored. Now, quite a long time ago, some of our predecessors invented words. Now, these remarkable little things could be piled and shuffled and turned into prose, poetry, lyrics, arguments, books and theories. Later, literacy was added to the armory, armory and the army, and people could read words as well as say them. A fellow called Richard Hoggart wrote a book probably 40 years ago called The Uses of Literacy, pointing out that this extraordinary gift has been largely misused. Overwhelmingly, people choose to read crap. Crap fiction, horoscopes or the TV guide or vacuous stories about celebrities pitched at the IQ of a mixoed rabbit. <laughs> Consider the waste of space in all forms of media and the waste of space in the human mind devoted to the vacuous notion of celebrity. And I have to tell you, I've known a great many of them. When I was making films, I dealt with a, a huge variety of famous actors, most of whom, I have to say, had the IQ of a mixed rabbit. But for me, the whole passion for celebrity reached its pinnacle in the multi-orgasmic joys surrounding the death of Princess Di or perhaps in the farcical fiasco of the O.J. Simpson trial, which many of you are too young to vividly recall. But celebrity worship is everywhere. It's uh, not entirely new. One of the first celebrities was Alexander the Great. He was in your line of business, and uh, as he wandered around the world, he kept leaving cities behind him called Alexandria. There were dozens of them, which must have made life very difficult for the postman. Uh, more recently, we had the first modern celebrity in Oscar Wilde. But to have so much media tedia about variations on the theme of Paris Hilton verges on the intolerable. It's the measure of the vacuity of many, if not the overwhelming majority of our fellow humans as we race our precious time and synaptic connections of our potentially marvellous human minds on dross. Yes, I'm being elitist. And we live in a country where the term elite is a pejorative. The political right abhors many an ism, communism obviously, also socialism, multiculturalism, postmodernism, and that old standby liberalism, which in the US context is deemed as bad as Islamism. But let me add, or we'll make a recent addition to the ism prism. Elitism. Along with political correctness, my very close friend John Howard, that's a joke you're permitted to laugh, <laughs> trotted that ism out a lot. On the one hand, he celebrated elitism in sport and commerce, 
Bradman was godlike in John's cosmology, as was Menzies, while the titans of the approved ism of capitalism were entitled to unfettered power and astronomic capitalism, a remuneration. Yet he saw elitism in any aspect of intellectual inquiry as deplorable and anti-democratic. Academics were, shudder, elitist, as were the Bradmans of science, particularly when they raised the issue of global warming. And John would be joined by supporters amongst the pundits and shock jocks in damning critics of his refugees policy as, yes, elitist. Now this gave us a bipolar world when cash for comment broadcasters manipulated populist responses from their loyal to a fault listeners. The duped were applauded for their earthy common sense. While in the same breath, the Alan Joneses, and I know them well, I worked with them in commercial radio until I came to what was left of my senses and went to the elephant's graveyard of the ABC. In the same breath, Alan would condemn anyone who tried to calibrate criticism on major issues. It was far worse in the US, as was evidenced by the Bush's, the Bush presidency's war on science. It was the most extraordinary thing that science was under the hammer from Washington throughout the, the Bush presidency. This played to an electorate that refuses to believe in evolution. Charles Darwin is another of those damned elitists. But it is the elites in science and research who drive knowledge and progress in all its aspects, from the astronomical to the medical. But for the anti-elitists, the dead ignorant or those who play them for suckers, they cherry-pick science for fun and profit. While rejecting evolution, they happily accept the life-saving responses to the rapidly evolving virus, medicine, that depends on an understanding of the mechanisms of evolution to work. Whilst grateful for the science that gives them flat screen tallies and bowings, they attack climate science as if they themselves were rabid antibodies. When it suits, it puts jism into capitalism and science is a useful servant. When it warns of the approach of disaster, the same scientists are damned as elitists or, just, or seen to be corrupted con men. As for academic critics of social policy, or even mild-mannered ABC employees like myself who give them airtime, they are elitists who should be ignored and deplored. Commercial broadcasters here kowtow to ratbags like Lord Monckton, populist media and politicians, uh, sorry, politicians is spelt with two L's whenever I say the word because they are slaves to the polls. They like to keep it simple and simple-minded. The attributes we admire in sporting elites or in the military's much admired elite services achieve their excellence, your excellence, through focus, determination, discipline, training and pain. And so do the elites who do the thinking for society. But the writers, researchers and scientists and scholars find it damned hard to get a hearing in the media, as opposed to the clowns and the populists. Nowhere does this issue more clearly represent a crisis than in the climate debate. I first learnt about climate change in the early 80s, right here in Canberra. I'd set up a thing called the Commission for the Future for my friend, the Minister for Science, Barry Jones. And my job was to build bridges of understanding between the, between the community and science. So I started by going up to talk to scientists. And there's a Bucky Fullman's uh, Minster Dome down the road, which I'm sure you've seen. Looks like a crash landed UFO. And that's where the scientists all hang out. And I went there and the top blokes, most of whom were Nobel laureates, had dinner for me. And I said, how's the world gonna end? What's the, what's the big issue? Each one of them had a different view. One of them thought nuclear war was a bit of a worry. Uh, the next one thought that what would become known as genetic engineering would be the problem, and that we were interfering so dangerously with evolution, and that we were about to create a superhuman who would be twice as intelligent, six inches taller, a life expectancy of 400 years, reducing the rest of us 
to the House to the status of uh, redundancy, or as he pointed out, perhaps some of us would be kept on as household pests. Uh, the next bloke thought the real problem was artificial intelligence, a similar prognosis, but it wasn't going to be humans of any sort that was the threat. It was going to be computer intelligence that would sweep us aside, that would find us unnecessary. Each one of them had the argument. But finally, I was persuaded by one quiet fellow who simply talked, early 80s, about the dials in his laboratory here in Canberra, showing an absolute inexorable increase in what are known as greenhouse gases and global temperature. And I remember him telling me that in his view the planet would become uninhabitable by 2050. Well, that's a bit pessimistic. Some think we may be able to live here for till perhaps 2070. Three cheers for that. Now, it became therefore one of my central issues and we worked very hard at it, but that's a, another story. What is clear, however, is that uh, we haven't done anything like enough. The, you know, I've seen this happen before. I've seen, I watched the unscrupulous campaign to deny the cigarette industry's complicity in the cancer pandemic. And we witnessed the same sort of cynicism, misinformation and irresponsibility. In some cases, from the very same scientists, I am fascinated to see some of the anti-cancer cigarette scientists, the people who denied that connection, still working in the field of climate change. Now, to some extent, tonight's grumble was provoked by an article of Errol Simper, who's a colleague of mine at The Australian. He's always defending SBS from enemies without and within. And um, he's having another go at it the other day. And he dragged out a quote that I would deployed in defence of the multicultural broadcaster. And some of you here tonight will remember when SBS was in fact multicultural. When I wrote that there was nothing wrong with the programming, the problem was the audience, and I hold this to be true. The problem is the audience. For good writing, the problem is the reader. In politics, the problem is the voter. The problem is that people have dumbed themselves down and continue to do so with nothing short of zeal. If uh, SBS, even at its best, had Moses ratings, that was not a failure of the SBS. It was a failure of viewers who overwhelmingly voted with their remote controls to look at crap. Amazingly, given the alternatives, television viewing is substantially up this year, at a time when Australian programming, most of which is pretty much as crappy as the imports, is dramatically down. And having devoted much of my life to an Australian film industry, imagine how pleased I am to learn that US programs have increased their market share this year by 157%. Now I can observe the same phenomenon as an ageing broadcaster on Radio National, the one part of the ABC that still vaguely values the Charter. The Charter is the sort of the, uh, the Bill of Rights that was nailed on the wall when commercial broadcasting, I'm sorry, when public broadcasting began. Having worked in commercial broadcasting, I'm very well aware of the guiding philosophy of a chat station. It is not to educate or inform. It is certainly not to pour oil on troubled waters. It's to throw petrol at any ember of conflict and do your best to get it blazing, as was the case with Alan Jones and the Cronulla riots. It is to grossly oversimplify any and every issue, to reduce it to a slogan. I left that world and joined Radio National because there, in contrast, people try to show that there aren't simply one side or two sides to a story, but very likely five or ten. That issues are complicated, need to be contextualised, but to do so condemns you to a, a comparatively small, sometimes dangerously small, share of audience. Currently, RN's management is embarking on a rejigging project to uh, attract a new audience whilst hoping upon hope they won't lose the, uh, the old ones. To that end, colleagues of mine are being shown the door and young voiced programs will replace a lot of the existing shows. As the oldest of Radio National's broadcasters, 
and I've been allowed to go off the life support system for an hour to be with you here. I am in no personal danger. My program does too well to be rendered redundant and uh, they're ready to let nature take its course. Well, the silly old bugger can't keep going much longer, can he? When they ask me how I'm feeling, they're disappointed if I report that I'm feeling quite well today, thank you. Mind you, that uh, small chair of audience isn't as small as you might lead, be led to believe. I always pretend I've only got one listener and that it's her name is Gladys, so I always talk about the listener as Gladys, plural, plural, Gladys. But in fact, I've got an audience that many a newspaper would envy and most magazines would die for. Furthermore, it's demographically fascinating in that 70% of my audience has tertiary education. I left school at 15, so I find this particularly pleasant. And, um, and because they're better educated, they're also much more affluent than those listening to the shock jocks. It is, if you like, an elite audience. And, um, but in every realm of human activity, Australians do dumb down and turn largely to American entertainers and those wretched celebrities for the distraction. Now, I don't wish this to descend into an anti-American diatribe. I take the very simple view that America sets the highest example in almost every sphere of human activity, in its aspirations, in its science, in its ancient belief in freedom, America, cutting edge. But it also sets the worst example. It does both ends of the spectrum, which is why Americans, for example, have more people in the slammer than even China, and why an incredible percentage of them are young African-American males. Now, let me say that when I talk about quality or elite, there is no financial impediment to quality. A good book costs no more than a bad book. Good food costs no more than junk food. A ticket to a film that at least tries to be challenging costs no more than one to the umpteenth adaption of a superhero comic strip. In fact, the best is usually a bargain. Now, not everyone is capable of climbing Everest. But we're talking of mass markets where people can't even be bothered to drag themselves up a molehill. It's not just dumbing down that should concern us. It's another problem of willful ignorance. You may remember a highly embarrassed James Murdoch sitting beside his dad, Rupert, for whom I've worked on and off for 40 or 50 years and whom I've known a hell of a long time, his mummified father, um, before a UK parliamentary select committee, claiming ignorance of shonky, con shonky conduct at the News of the World. An MP, Adrian Sanders, asked James if he was familiar with the notion of willful blindness. James didn't know what it was, so he, it was explained that it was a legal term that came up during the Enron scandal, meaning that if there is knowledge that you could have had and should have had, but chose not to have, you are still responsible. Murdoch Jr.'s response, I'm not aware of that particular phrase, and the interrogation about executive conduct intensified, and it's redoubling at this very moment. Now, Margaret Heffernan, an ex-BBC producer, and now a visiting professor and entrepreneur in residence at the University of Bath, came on to talk about this with me. Her book is called Willful Blindness, subtitle, Why We Ignore the Obvious at Our Peril. And uh, the major examples of willful blindness she provided, apart from Enron, uh, requiring a corporate or political uh, labrador and a white cane for the fully sighted, included Abu Ghraib, the BP spill, Lehman Brothers, and to that list I added Bush's connection of the Twin Towers to Saddam Hussein, and a major invasion justified, at least initially, by non-existent WMDs. We agreed on the willful blindness of Alan Greenspan with his quasi-religious faith in deregulating markets. And um, 
we talked about a guy called Festinger, who had a theory of cognitive dissonance, which he produced while studying millenarian religious movements. They're the, the cults that believe the world is coming to an end next Tuesday. And when next Tuesday comes and the world hasn't come to an end, do you think that would wipe them out? No. If anything, it makes them stronger. They um, go through a sort of a... A, a, a sort of strange willful blindness and they rationalise their stupidity. The coalition of the willing's determination to evade Iraq, comparably millenarian and in terms of George W. messianic, provides further evidence of the theory. I'm fascinated and appalled by cognitive dissonance and willful blindness in our social and political behaviour right here in Australia. It began with the notion of terra nullius, where the first white Australians managed to be blind to the fact that many millions of indigenous people had lived in this country for millennia and the place was as fully occupied as environmental circumstances allowed. That cognitive dissidence would erupt again and again as everyone from early colonists to mining companies pushed and shoved and indigenous groups to a large extent achieving without the slightest sense of guilt an invisible people, to invisible in many cases because they were either dead or driven off. A more recent example for me was the response to asylum seekers. What Howard and Ruddick did and what Kim, Kim Beasley shamelessly acquiesced to was to demonise the quite small numbers of desperate and often brave people who were heading for our shores, usually fleeing the acknowledged horrors of the Taliban or Saddam Hussein. Tyranny is so appalling that we were told only all-out war could deal with them. Now you'll recall that asylum seekers became boat people, this to distinguish them from the overwhelmingly larger numbers of visa jumpers who arrived by air, by Boeing instead of boat, and representing about 1 or 2% of our total intake of migrants in every category. They became illegal, something they were not. They were characterised as queue jumpers, though they were fleeing countries where there was no queue to jump, no possibility of an ordered or regulated exit. It was more than hinted at that their numbers contained terrorists who would bring Australia down. Now, all of this was energetically marketed by politicians through the shock jocks and the pundits and the public bought it. But more importantly, they demanded it. And this is what I, I must stress. The public wanted to hear this. They didn't want to hear contrary information. It was a strange phenomenon which involved a resurgence of the dark days of white Australia and the professed national ethos of tolerance disappeared all but overnight. I was appointed to a COAG committee, the Council of Australian Governments, to report back to all the governments, federal, state and territories, on how we should celebrate the centenary of federation, which was going to coincide, you'll recall, with the Sydney Olympics. We went around the country, this tense and difficult committee, acrimonious committee, because we were for all over, all over the political spectrum. And we came back with a report that everyone signed off on. I wrote it and I'm proud of the fact that everyone agreed to affix the signature because it became quite clear to us what Australians wanted to celebrate. They wanted, when I asked them what made them proud to be an Australian, what was the essence of being an Australian, there was only one word. It was tolerance. Now, I'm not that... In favour of the word, tolerance involves the notion of toleration. I will tolerate you. But it's a, you know, it's a damn sight better than nothing. And it was a universal statement. Minutes later, after we signed off on the report, after it was agreed to, along came Pauline Hanson, who pressed a couple of buttons, and that tolerance evaporated. It just disappeared overnight. And so we finished up celebrating the centenary of Australia 
without a celebration of tolerance, without a republic, without reconciliation. And incidentally, everyone, even the RSL and the CWA, people who I thought would be absolutely intractably opposed to the republic, took the view that, we sh that it was inevitable, that we'd just sign off and get on with the rest of our lives. I suddenly realised that Australians were self-deluding and that I'd been deluded, along with almost every one of my friends, into believing that we had reached a new plateau, a new point of sophistication, and that Australia might very well enter the 21st century as a symbol of what a society, a mongrel society, a mixed up, complex society of colours and religions and can achieve with some degree of mutual, uh, of mutual respect. I now see that same lack of tolerance enduring all these years later in the ongoing response to asylum seekers. And we're still seeing the same tugging and froing between the Conservatives and the Labor government in accommodating each other's paranoia. I um, found in the latter part of the last century that uh, we had a dumbed down democracy with lying on an industrial scale. But the guilt is as much or more with the public as it is with any professional liars in the political profession or my own profession in the media. The voters listen to what they want to hear and they filter out contradictory information. I will go to my grave knowing that Hawke or Keating would have behaved more honourably, would have pressed different buttons, that uh, the buttons of a fair go and perhaps that old standby mateship to turn public opinion around. But no one pressed that button, not even Kim Beasley and the Labor Party. So we now have Tony Abbott as a one-man Billy, uh, as a one-man Tea Party. I call it the Billy Tea Party here. It's the one that regularly bores its Billy outside Parliament and rallies in, with rallies compared by my old friend Alan Cash for comment Jones. I, um, it concerns me that this process is galloping ahead. I, uh, and it's intensified now by the new technologies. I'm racing through this so I can get to question time. First of all, these days, because mass media is over, it's effectively gone. When I was a kid, radio was a choice of five or six uh, AM stations. Now there is an infinite number of radio stations, digital, all the rest. And each radio station has a tiny slice of an audience, not mass appeal. When I was growing up, the Woman's Weekly was the most comprehensively successful magazine in the world in that more Women's Weeklies went into more Australian homes than any magazine, say, in the United States, Life or Saturday Evening Post. Nowadays, the Woman's Weekly is a monthly, it's on hard times, because there is a myriad magazines aimed at tiny subgroups of the female market. Television, the same. Mass media is gone with the wind. So what we have now is this infinity of choice with the new technologies. And it is very easy for someone to put themselves in their own media balloon in which all other information is watered off, bounces off the rubbery surface of that balloon. Nowadays, you choose your belief and then you seek evidence for it. We intensify our views, our existing views, by isolating ourselves in an electronic sub-community, which in many cases is tantamount to being a cult. Mass media had its disadvantages. It was wrong for two or three very powerful men to dominate this society or the UK or the US. But I must say, much and all as I deplore what Rupert has done, I must say this about him. He doesn't invent bad behaviour. English newspapers were crap before Rupert got there. What he has is a great gift for intensifying something he sees in the air, and he exaggerates the tendencies. Rupert didn't invent 
lunar right-wing politics in America. They pre-existed him by generations. But he worked out how to make them, how to inflame them with Fox News. And in Australia, much the same process, although to a less alarming level, has occurred. But now what we do is we choose our belief system, then we lock ourselves inside it, and we simply ignore opposing information. We've never had as much data. Everything is instantly accessible through the tentacles of the net. But until that data is processed, it doesn't become information. And until that information is thought through, it isn't knowledge. And until, and this very rarely occurs, until that knowledge is processed by people who think, who truly think, there is no wisdom. So one of my adages is, data isn't information, information isn't knowledge, and knowledge isn't wisdom. So I come back to a world of slothful, lazy, complacent, greedy, unlovely fellow citizens for whom shopping is a hundred times more important than thinking, who now ward wisdom off just as they choose to deny knowledge and remain willfully ignorant of information whilst being excruciatingly selective with the data. In our poll-driven politics, as I've said, I've taken to spend dispelling politicians with two L's, but I don't entirely blame them. They are victims of the same exhilarating tendencies and they're often running just to keep up with communal prejudice. What you've heard from me is, of course, the bitter complaints of a doddery old bloke. And when I talk like this, I'm reminded of another doddery old bloke called Pablo Casals. Pablo Casals was a great cellist, a great Spanish cellist. And he survived all the, the terrible modern history of Spain, of the Civil War, of the Second World War, of the Franco era and beyond. And he'd outlived Franco and he outlived the dark days. And on his, on his 80th birthday, there was a big press conference for him in Madrid. And he wasn't very happy about what he was watching in the New Spain, not even in the New Spain. So like me, he complained. And then suddenly he stopped. And it was as if he'd heard himself for the first time. He fell silent. And then he said two things, two sentences, that I wholeheartedly endorse and embrace. Now at first sight or first sound, they don't seem to fit. They don't go together. But in a deeper sense, they are profoundly connected. And these are the sentences. The situation is hopeless. We must take the next step. And that's all I ask my fellow citizens to do. The situation is hopeless, the economic, situation, the environmental situation, religious conflicts, whatever. They're all vast, complex and apparently overwhelming. But we cannot and must not use that as our excuse, excuse sorry, for inertia. We must take the next step. This doesn't necessarily involve marching in the streets or waving placards or smashing and looting. It does not necessarily require us to join or rejoin the smouldering ruins of our political parties. And I left the ALP after 50 years because I, I just couldn't bear to vote for it again. It doesn't necessarily demand that we sign up for this pressure group or that NGO, but it does demand that you, in your uniform or out of it, as soldiers, sailors, naval people, or as civilians, that you seek ways to engage, to involve, and to change, that we discuss, we debate, we try. Otherwise, the rest of this century may well be characterised by escalating catastrophes as we watch the poisoning or evaporation of our fresh water, the retreat of food production, the advance of epidemics, and uh, what will become as we get wars over water and wars over, and wars over food, the thuggery of people for whom the next step might well become the goose step. How anyone can be bored for a minute, for a second, in our all too brief lives, astonishes me. 
Every night I sit in the studio, I'll do it tonight, go down the road and do another program. I try to raise a couple of issues. But every night I could, if there was time, raise a hundred. For every book we can discuss, for every academic theory, there are countless others jostling in the queue, trying to get noticed, read or heard. And the same applies to every aspect of human life. 600,000 hours is not enough. The reason that I'm really crooked on God, if I believed in it, is that uh, I'd prefer six million because there's so much to think about, there's so much to learn, there's so much to know. Life is so fascinating and I'm confident that you share this view. But what are we to do with the majority of Avalos citizens who, it sadly seems, do not? Thank you.